So, welcome to my talk. My name is Peter Holmberg. Today I will talk about concepts. Nice to see so many of you here. Um, so, um, just over a week ago, we actually got news that from Herb Sutter that the C++ 17 standard has been unanimously uh, approved. So there's just a few formal steps away to publication. Uh, and the Standards Committee are already working on uh, C++ 20. So, uh, and concepts are uh, the first major new feature uh, to have been voted into the draft of that C++ 20 standard. Uh, but actually, concepts have already been available uh, for a couple of years in the form of a technical specification, uh, a sort of a optional extension to the language. Um, and it is implemented already in GCC, starting with uh, GCC 6. So it's actually a, future, uh, a feature you can already experiment with. Um, so, uh, so in this talk I will try to explain what concepts are, uh, where they come from, what they are useful for. Uh, and then I'm going to show what they will look like in C++20. Uh, and then we're going to try to implement a concept in C++20 to illustrate the process. Uh, and of course if you have any questions or comments or anything, feel free to raise your hand and uh, stop me at any point if I'm uh, not clear enough. So, uh, where do concepts come from? Uh, so this is Alexander Stepanov, whom many of you probably recognize best as the creator of the original version of STL, uh, parts of which made it into the C++ standard already back in the 90s. Um, and STL was the first famous example of generic programming, this particular programming style that he pioneered. Uh, actually, the, the term generic programming was first used uh, in a paper in 1988, before he started working with uh, C++. Um, and uh, in generic programming, uh, as I'm sure you know, the focus is not on specific types, but on the design of algorithms and data structure as efficient reusable components that you can use across entire families of related types, similar types. Uh, and these families of types are what he decided to call concepts. Uh, so actually, Stepanov, he, he retired uh, beginning of last year. Uh, he got this nice stamp as a retirement present. Uh, and before he did, he uh, wrote two books about this. Uh, so with Paul McJones, he wrote Elements of Programming, and with uh, Daniel Rose from Mathematics to Generic Programming. Uh, so a lot of uh, theory in this talk is based on material that you will find in these books uh, if you are interested in digging deeper. Um, okay, so how did Stepano find his concepts? Um, so he, he was looking at uh, interesting algorithms implemented on specific types uh, and asking himself what could what are the properties of the type that are really used by the algorithm? And how much can I remove from a type and still have the algorithm work uh, and be as efficient uh, as it is with just one type? And then by gradually sort of removing uh, type properties, uh, he, would, he would make it more and more generic, discover uh, sets of types that could work with this algorithm, and also discover that often there are uh, entire clusters of algorithms requiring the same uh, properties of types, uh, and then you have found a concept. So on a high level, you can think of a concept just as a collection of types uh, or classes, much in the same way that you can think of a class as a collection of instances of objects that you can create with that type. So it's just a higher level of abstraction there. Uh, it's exactly analogous to how we organize knowledge about similar things in other fields of thought. So relationship between a concept and a type is exactly the same kind of relationship between a theory and a model in mathematics or a genus and a species in 
uh, natural science. Um, so there are many examples of this in C++. Uh, we could look at, for example, at the integer type. C++ has many distinct integer types. And uh, even if they all had differences, they are all basically the same, right? They, they model some subset of the mathematical integers. Uh, we, we can do basic arithmetic with them and so on. Uh, and that's just one example. Of course, there are many others. So these are just a few, and I, I'm sure you can think of many more. Uh, even one and the same type can belong to many concepts. Um, and of course, these, these concepts really doesn't have anything to do with C++. You can find them in any programming language you like, uh, basically the same. Um, so this is an important point. Don't get stuck in your head the concept is some future C++ feature. You're actually using concepts today all the time in your code, and not only in C++. If you're, when you program, you're thinking in terms of concepts naturally uh, every day. And uh, uh, if you write a piece of generic code, keep in mind that uh, generic programming has nothing to do with writing templates or using macros or abstract interfaces or dynamic typing or whatever other language feature that you may have uh, to write reusable pieces of code. What generic programming is really about is writing code targeting concepts instead of just single types. Um, so how, do you, how can you define a concept then? Um, you can view a concept as a set of requirements on types or as a predicate that you use to test whether types meet those requirements. And there are three important kinds of requirements. First of all, what are the operations that a type must provide? So if you think about integer types, all integer types should have a plus operator. We need a consistent interface to be able to write binary code uh, using them. Uh, but that requirement is purely syntactic. That's only interface. What's even more important and interesting is the actual semantics of those operations. Uh, so standard string, for example, also has a plus operator, but it doesn't do integer addition. It, it's something completely different, so that is not an integer. Um, and last but not least, it can be important to know the time and space complexity of an operation as well, because this will determine what are the algorithm you can use with this type. So if you had a, an integer type with a plus that grew exponentially slower when the numbers got bigger, something like that, that would not be a useful integer type. Um, so you say that a type satisfies a concept, or it's a model of a concept, if it meets all of these requirements. Um, and of course, STL got us used to thinking like that. So STL is all designed around concepts. Uh, there's the concept of containers. Containers not a type, it's a concept. You can create any number of container types, just composing types together, or even building a container from scratch. Um, and you know they are different, but essentially the same. They are collections of objects with ownership semantics. Uh, they all have a size member function that gives you the number of elements in constant time. You can get iterators out of them and so on. So that's what makes them containers. Uh, of course, iterators, also concepts, uh, basically based on the semantics of pointers from C. Um, and uh, uh, of course, many of the standard algorithms also take some kind of invocable type as an argument. So this could be a, uh, uh, a function object or a lambda or even a function pointer. So these are types where you can invoke the object like a function. Uh, so I'm sure you're familiar with those. Uh, even more fundamental for STL is a concept that Stepanov re refers to as regular types. And uh, regular types are basically the types that STL is designed to work with. They will store, be naturally stored in containers and work with all relevant uh, algorithms. So I'm not going to go into details on these concepts. We're actually going to look at an even more fundamental concept uh, that can be seen as a building block for uh, some of these. Uh, and that concept is called semi-regular. Um, so even if you're not familiar with that name, you, you're all familiar with semi-regular types. Usually we talk about types having value semantics. Uh, basically self-contained types, types that you can copy. 
uh, and that includes uh, all the simple built-in types, many of the library types, as well as classes composed out of semi-regular types. Uh, and they have many nice properties. Uh, they're easy to understand for us programmers since they basically behave like built-in types. Uh, they're also easy to understand for compilers, the kind of code transformations that compilers do to optimize code based on uh, simple types. It can also apply exactly the same on user-defined types if they are semi-regular. Um, they can be passed to functions by value or reference, whichever you like, and returned by value. They will behave like you expect them to. Uh, they are composed naturally in standard data structures. Uh, all the STL containers have the nice property that a container of semi-regular objects is in itself a semi-regular object. So you can store that in another container and it still works uh, without changing the behavior. Um, and this satisfies basic requirements for most of the standard algorithms. Uh, usually there are more requirements, but uh, that's it. So, how can you define that concept now in C++20? Uh, so here's a new syntax uh, in the draft standard. So you define concept like a template, uh, followed by the new keyword concept uh, to make it a concept, followed by the name, uh, equals, and then uh, a Boolean expression. And this Boolean expression can be almost as complex as you like, uh, but it has to be possible to evaluate at compile time. Uh, so, so this whole thing is a compile time predicate used to test whether a type satisfies the concept you, you describe. Um, and the most important use of, of a concept is together with generic code. So t today if you want to write a generic function or a generic class or a C++14, a generic variable, uh, you would write something like template type name t. Uh, and what you're saying about that type t is of course that T can be any type whatsoever. There are no constraints on what that type uh, can be. But of course, that's not ever actually true. There are going to be constraints based on the use of that type inside of the implementation. Um, and we're all familiar with what happens when the compiler tries to instantiate the template and somewhere deep inside the implementation, it fails. You get quite interesting error messages. <laughs> and uh, so this is where concepts come in. The problem here is that this interface is not very good, right? It it's allows too many types to get through. And with concepts, what you can do is you add a second new keyword, requires, like this. Uh, this is called the requires clause. And it's followed by, uh, again, a compile time Boolean expression, which can be the invocation of a concept. So now, uh, these templates can be instantiated only if T is a semi-regular type. Of course, right now I'm just returning true, so this will make no difference at all. Uh, so what we really have to do is to redefine that Boolean expression. Um, uh, also note that uh, just because we add this extra check uh, doesn't mean that we're not allowed to do anything inside the implementation that goes beyond the concept uh, requirements. Uh, and this is deliberate. This is actually a good thing. You can sort of gradually introduce concepts into uh, old code. Um, yes. So before we go into definition of semi-regular, um, just a note on the difference between this technical specification that you can use today and uh, the upcoming uh, standard for which we don't have a compiler yet, is that the syntax has changed a little bit. It used to be concept bool semi-regular. Uh, but this bool has been removed since it always has to be a bool. Uh, so a suggestion if you want to experiment with concepts, uh, get used to the new syntax and use that. And you can just put a macro somewhere <laughs> and redefine concept that concept bool. Then you only have one line of code to remove later when you get a C++20 compiler. Um, and even if you don't have any uh, concept support, Consider just adding requires uh, to your templates today, but like a comment. Uh, at the very least, you have better documentation of your uh, generic code, and eventually you can have the compiler help you check that. Okay. Um. 
So, to illustrate a semi-regular type, I'm going to implement a very simple example type. Um, and the type is going to be uh, representing a playing card from a standard deck of playing cards. So, a playing card has two interesting features. Uh, this is the rank of the card, its numeric value, and the suit, clubs, hearts, spades and diamonds. And of course you might also have jokers in the deck, which have neither a rank or a suit. Um, so there are many ways you can implement a type like this. Uh, here's my suggestion. Um, so I use an enum class for the rank and suit, since I figure I might want to use names of the cards. Uh, and I reserve the zero values for jokers, since they are naturally free. So, But this is not important, uh, the details. Uh, just note that rank and suit are already semi-regular types, and this class is just a composition of two semi-regular types making it also semi-regular. And why is that? Um, so, here we have two objects, two playing cards, and with, with semi-regular types you can turn one of these objects into a copy of the other. So we have a copy assignment. We read from the right object and overwrite the object on the left side. And we get two equal objects two separate objects representing the same abstract thing, the same playing card. Uh, so this is mathematical equality, not assignment. Um, okay, so we need a copy assignment operator. And in this case it's very trivial, we just copy assign the members and return a reference to the object itself. Uh, and of course, in this case, I wouldn't need to implement this. This is what the compiler would give me for free if I don't implement this. I'm only showing this for demonstration. Um, but this is an operation on the type, right? So we can describe that using a concept. And I'm going to call the concept assignable. Um, and so what follows here is, again, a little new syntax. Uh, so you can also use requires keyword inside of a concept. Uh, and it kind of looks like some strange function definition or something, but it's not. This is just an expression. It's called a requires expression. And all that is saying is that given two objects, A and B, A of type T and B of type const T ref, uh, then this expression inside the braces has to be a wa valid expression for, for these objects with a return type that is T ref or convertible to T ref. Um, so this, in other words, we need a copy assignment operator, or we can use a simple built-in type that already has copy assignment defined by the language. Um, so so uh, when the compiler checks, checks this, uh, it looks, does it have a copy assignment operator, then this whole expression becomes true and the type satisfies the concept. Uh, but remember I told that there were three kinds of requirements. This is purely syntactic. It's just, and that is actually all that C++ concepts will help us with today. Um, but there's also important semantics here. So I put this as comments. Um, so of course the copy assignment operator should create copies. We need to have uh, copy semantics. Uh, and what that means is that if we copy B into A, then A is truly equal to B. So this function EQ here, it's nothing you would have to implement, I just use it to illustrate that there's some notion of equality for this type, uh, which you get like that. Um, also, uh, copy assignment should be pretty fast, typically not worse than linear in the area of the object. So, what is area of? This is nothing that you have in standard library, you could easily implement it. Uh, so think of area of like size of. What does size of do if you pass it an object? It gives you uh, the size of the object in bytes, as in the size of the class that defines it. Uh, and for simple objects like the card type, area of would return exactly the same thing. Uh, but sometimes you have composite objects. So what is a composite object? It's basically an object containing some pointers to some remote parts that also belong to the object. So think, if you think of standard vector, for example, inside vector is a pointer to some memory area where the elements of the vector are stored. Uh, so uh, there are many ways you can implement vector. Here's one example. Uh, 
So we have the local part with the pointers inside the class itself, and there are remote parts uh, where the elements are stored. Um, and with size of, you would only get the size of that local part, the size of three pointers here. With area of, you get that size plus the size of all the elements together. So clearly, if we are to copy an object, like a vector, we have to touch both the local part and the remote part. So that's what area of means. Okay, so now we can start defining semi-regular. So you can use a concept inside of another concept to compose them into bigger concepts like this. Uh, so a semi-regular type is something that's assignable. So in order to have copies, of course, we need to have objects in the first place. And if we have objects, eventually something's going to happen to them. They're going to fall out of scope and get destroyed. So C++ is going to call a destructor and free all of the resources of the object and make it go away. Um, so we also need a destructor here. Uh, of course, in this case, again, the destructor is trivial. All the resources are the only resource is raw memory, so it's an empty function. Uh, but again, this is an operation, and we can use a concept to describe it. So I call this concept destructible. And so here again, we could use a requires expression with an ex explicit call to the destructor. Uh, but that's, there's a slight problem with that in C++. We have types in C++ that are destructible, but you cannot call the destructor explicitly, namely arrays. So in a few cases like this, it's actually useful to fall back on an older technique. You can use type traits uh, built into the language. So this standard is no throw destructible V. It's actually C++ 17 shorthand for standard is no throw destructible of V colon colon value. So if you don't, if you don't know about type traits, that is, that's okay. You can think of this as a function call, but a function call at compile time. This is a type function, a function that takes type arguments uh, instead of objects. Uh, so this will return true for destructible types that don't throw exceptions. Uh, of course, there's also an axiom here. Uh, it should end the lifetime of the object after ending the lifetime of its members in the reverse declaration order and without throwing exceptions, blah, blah, blah. You probably know all that, so I'm just going to refer to the standard that's explained in great detail. Um, also, what's the complexity of a destructor? Uh, it's nice to think that it should be constant time, but you may be in a system where you have to write zeros to all the memory you release for security reasons or whatever. Um, so again, we say it's complexity is linear in the area of the object that we destroy. Okay, so semi-regular type is assignable and destructible. Okay, so if we are able to, or if we're going to be able to destroy objects, of course we need to be able to create them in the first place as well. So we need some form of constructor. And in particular, semi-regular types require that we have a default constructor. So what should a default constructor do? If you think about constructors in general, what do they do? They take some raw memory, which I illustrate like that, uh, and they turn it into a well-formed object, an object that represents some valid value for the type, right? Uh, but if you apply that to the default constructor, you get a little problem. What is, what is a, a good default value? Uh, what is a good default playing card? I don't know. There's no really good answer to that. Of course, you can just choose a value uh, arbitrarily. Maybe that's a good idea. But technically, you don't really have to answer that question. Uh, instead, you should ask yourself, what would the ints do? So if you look at simple built-in types like int, uh, if you instantiate an integer on the uh, in a local uh, in inside a function as a local variable, what is the value of that integer? Well, the standard says that value is not specified, right? It's not any particular value at all. It's even undefined behavior to try to read from that uninitialized integer. So for all we know, that could throw some hardware exception or whatever. Of course, on most platforms that won't happen. So if you ignore the warnings and you do it anyway, you will appear to get some random integer just based on whatever bits are on the stack, right? Uh, but 
conceptually what you have there is really not an integer. I like to view it more like there's an in-shaped hole there. It's not quite an integer yet. There's a space there in memory for an integer. Um, but that's actually okay because we can assign to it and make it a well-formed integer. Or whether we assign to it or not, when it falls out of scope and gets destroyed, that should be okay as well. So Stepanov has a name for this. He calls it partially formed state. So an object is in a partially formed state if it can be assigned to or destroyed. Uh, if it's partially formed but not well formed, it's not complete yet, uh, the effect of any other procedure than assigned and destruction is not defined. Uh, so if you want to, you can think of default constructed playing card as a blank playing card. It's, it's not a valid playing card really. You can't use it, but um, you could write on it. Let's say you lost a playing card. You could scribble something on it and use it as a replacement, or you could throw it away. That needs to be okay. And that means our default constructor here can be an empty function as well. So rank and suit might be garbage, but if we look in the cop assignment operator, all we do there is write to them, so making it a well-formed object before we return. And the destructor does nothing, so that's fine as well. We don't worry about other functions. Um, so to describe this concept, uh, I'm going to need a little helper concept to start with. Uh, so constructible means that we are destructible, as already defined. And for simplicity, we use another type trait here. A standard is, no f is constructible. Uh, so this is an example of very addic type trait and a very addic concept. This would cover all constructors with any number of arguments. Um, and using that, I can say default constructible is constructible with no arguments. Uh, so semi-regular type is assignable and default constructible. Uh, so I removed destructible from here since that's included inside of uh, default constructible. Um, and we add this notion of a partially formed state. So a default constructed object is not necessarily well formed as we would normally assume of all objects. Uh, but we can assign or destroy. Uh, and that means the complexity of default constructor can be linear in the size of the object. Typically actually constant time or no operation at all. So that's really nice. So we have default construction and we have copy assignments. So now we can combine them. So we take some raw memory, we default construct an object there, we take another object and we copy assign it and we get two equal objects. So now not only can we turn objects into copies, we can create brand new copies. Uh, but of course there is a second way of doing this in C++. Uh, conceptually uh, or semantically the same but potentially faster. We could have a copy constructor. We just take some raw memory, another object, we copy construct it in place and we get the same end result. So we should have a copy constructor as well. Uh, very simple here, we just copy construct the members in declaration order. Um, and the concept, quite straightforward as well. Uh, copy constructible me means we're constructible, this time with one argument to the constructor of type const tref, that's a copy constructor. Uh, it gives us copy semantics, so an object uh, copy constructed out of A would be equal to A. And uh, again, complexity linear in the area of the object. Um, so there are two ways to create copies that should act the same. When you implement one, you should always implement the other. So we can uh, group them into a concept copyable, if you're both copy constructible and copy assignable. And say that semi-regular types should be copyable and default constructible. Okay. C++11 made it a little bit more complex because we got move assignment added to the language. So we've got two more special member functions. First we have a move assignment. It's kind of like copy assignment. You have an object, you take another object, and instead of copying it over, you move it over. Like that. Uh, now remember that if you have a type with a copy, copy assignment operator, but you don't have a move assignment operator, that's fine. You can still call move on that because the compiler will just fall back on the copy assignment operator in that case. Uh, and it can do that because uh, copy assignment fulfills all the requirements of 
move assignment. When you move, you still uh, get a copy in the sense that the object you move to becomes equal to the object you move from, right? But uh, the semantics is weaker than copy assignment. We don't require that we have equality when the move is complete. Uh, and that's great because that means we can mutate the object that we move from. And that's useful for uh, composite types because then we can just transfer ownership of pointers to the remote parts without touching them and make move very efficient. Um, but there are still requirements on that object that we leave behind when we move because yeah, we don't actually move anything. Uh, we're going to leave some kind of object behind and eventually uh, that object might be destroyed so we sh should still have uh, destructor calls should still be var valid on that object on the right side. Uh, and also, of course, that object, it's still useful memory space there. We should be able to put another card there, uh, either through copy assignment or another move assignment. Um, so it seems pretty clear that this object should at least be partially formed. But actually that's not quite enough, because if you go and read the standard, uh, these concepts are actually described in this library part of the standard already today, but they're not referred to as concepts, they're called library requirements. Uh, and so here's what it says about move assignment. Uh, if you do a move assignment, uh, the object on the right side, uh, they refer to as RV, uh, they don't say its state is partially formed, they actually say RV state is unspecified, we don't know anything about it except for this interesting note. Uh, RV must still meet the requirements of the library component that is using it. The operations listed in those requirements must work as specified whether RV has been moved from or not. So this can be take some time to digest, but basically if you think you're a, imagine you're an uh, implementer of a standard library implementation, you could sort of assume, you're, the standard says it's free for you to assume that you can still use objects that have been moved from as if they hadn't been moved from. Uh, but you don't know their state, you don't know their value, so at least you should be able to call functions on that object that have no preconditions on, on the value. So it's like this would be a perfectly valid situation for move. So we have changed the card on the right side, we, might, we, we can't even know what it is, but we know it's still a valid playing card. Of course, that's not what we should do in this case, because we can't move any faster than by just making a copy, so the implementation is the same as the copy assignment. Um, so, to describe this, uh, I could use a new concept, but I'm actually just going to extend the assignable concept. So with standard forward, you can cover both move and copy in this case. So if you're not used to standard forward, just trust me, it works. <laughs> uh, so this covers both copy and move assignment. Um, but of course then there are different semantics. We have copy semantics, as before, when we do a copy, and we have move semantics when we do a move. So if A and B are equal, we could move B out into some third object C, then A and C are still equal, even if B has changed. Um, and uh, if we have an operation that doesn't have any preconditions, on the value, we can move out an object and still use that operation. Uh, also, complexity is different, so copy assignment linear in the area of, move assignment linear in the size of the object. Okay, so not, not many changes here, we just add move as one of the valid things we could do with a default constructed object. Okay, so just one more left, the move constructor. Kind of same as the copy constructor, except that we, we move instead of copy. Um, in the case here, we just make a copy in the same way. So, to be move constructible, we should be constructible, this time an R value reference for the move constructor. Um, again, we have move semantics, so an object move constructed out of A is if A and B are equal, an object moved out of A is still equal to B. Uh, and we can call a function on the moved 
an object if it has been moved constructed out of uh, and the complexity is again linear in the size of A um, so uh, since we can fall back on copy construction when we have move construction means it, we are if we are copy constructed we are also move constructible two ways of doing move so if we are move constructible and move assignable we are movable and I add movable as a part of copyable so I don't actually have to change anything here it's just that copy, copyable now covers all those four special member functions uh, copy and move constructor, copy and move assignment and that's it uh, so the definition here of semi-regular is actually not that far from what probably will make it into the standard eventually um, except that of course I simplified a lot here <laughs> so uh, actually uh, what I ignored is type conversions so to deal with type conversions you need to add a few more concepts a few more uh, rules but it's not that interesting it's you can think about what you need to do that uh, as an exercise if you like uh, this is the most important part. Um, okay, so if we go back and look at the type, I implemented all those six special member functions in the way the compiler would have done if I just wrote that. So actually, C++ already gives me semi-regular types uh, in cases like this for free. So this just describes things you've sort of always known, <laughs> even if you hadn't thought about it in this kind of formal way. So, can be quite overwhelming when you look at in these <laughs> all these details. So I think it can be kind of helpful to illustrate it graphically like this and see how these uh, concepts uh, depend on each other. It's actually they're tightly connected, and it's it's not that complicated. It's a, just a DAG that goes up to some simple uh, concepts. Uh, and of course the name semi-regular implies that there's something missing here so the semi part of this uh, the most important parts of that at least are two more uh, concepts concepts of equality and of total ordering uh, and there are differences here between Stepanov's definition and what might make it into the standard in the future but uh, the green ones you will probably see uh, in the standard and uh, they are referred to as foundational concepts they are foundational for the kind of value oriented programming style that we see in the STL um, the, the blue concepts here are usually referred to as language concepts they are not that interesting concepts as standalone concepts they just describe uh, functions inside of the language uh, and they are mostly you, they're not that useful as standalone concepts. You just use them to compose bigger concepts in this case. Yes? So, what does this graph mean for the uh, error messages? Will you get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <laughs> 6, 7, uh, 7, yeah. 8 error message? Yeah, currently in GCC, the, f the, the f early in GCC, I think 6.1, it just used to say something like, uh, template instantiation failed, constraint not satisfied, uh, this is not semi-regular, let's say. Uh, so now it's been extended a bit, so it goes uh, further down. It's not semi-regular because you don't have a copy assignment operator or something like that. So, yeah, it's kind of, they, they're finding a good trade-off between simple error messages and uh, actually sort of details so you can dig down and see what, what you need to do. Um, yes. Good question. Uh, I, I have a question. Yes? The, the blue ones, is this, are those defined by, by you for this presentation? Uh, no, uh, this is, yeah, with a few simplifications. What I did was I based this on uh, Eric Niebler's uh, technical specification, uh, uh, the ranges technical specification, which is based on, uh, based on uh, the concepts feature. So you can actually go and read that technical specification, see how they defined it. And they're still tweaking details a lot, so it's, uh, it's not sure it will look exactly like this. Uh, there are a lot of like, small technical issues with strange yeah, things in C++. Yeah, copyable implies movable, yeah? Yeah. Uh, and that's not really what you think of uh, when you think of copyable. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's kind of because language can fall back on copying if it cannot move. So it's yeah, I agree. It, it, it's it can be very complex when you start thinking about this and how is this actually the right way to define it? You could tweak it, but but uh, yeah, and and it's, that's an important point. Designing concepts correctly is really hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, take uh, the STD vector. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Interesting points. I have to think about that for a little bit. <laughs> there might be like changes in the uh, Reindis proposal related to that. Um, anyway. Um, yeah. Detail, uh, just for the uh, YouTube recording, could you please? Re Repeat the question. Yes, yes. Later viewers can. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I'm I'm gonna wrap this up uh, with uh, a quote again by Stepanov, uh, which I think is is uh, quite important. So one of your central goals as programmer should be to identify existing concepts in your application. You'll often develop new algorithms, occasionally develop a new data structure, and only rarely define a new concept. In that rare situation, a lot of work is needed to ensure that it's a true concept and not just a collection of unrelated requirements. So I think as with, with all new language features, when we get them, it's going to be very tempting to start inventing all sorts of new application-specific concepts. Uh, and and uh, then we're going to start trying to combine them in all sorts of different ways. We get an explosion of names, and it's not clear what they what they mean. So this is not the way to go. Actually, uh, I think kind of the way that I describe semi-regular here is is the way you should go about it. For, even if the concepts in C++ are just syntax, it's actually the semantics that defines the structure there. So focus on the semantics and only build up concepts from pieces that you already understand very well. So a concept that is only syntax is not really a concept. It's not very uh, useful. So um, some more information if you're interested. Uh, if you want to read up on generic programming, there's a great website by Paul McJones. Uh, where he collected all the interesting uh, uh, papers, lecture notes, uh, links to books, links to videos, interviews, and so on, by Alex Stepanov and his colleagues. Um, uh, of course, you should read the books. I recommend starting with this one. Don't be afraid uh, of the title if you're afraid of mathematics. <laughs> it's actually really approachable books. It's quite fun to read, and uh, yeah. Really recommend it. If you want to dig even deeper, there is this book, uh, Elements of Programming. Much, much harder book. It's very terse, very mathematical. Uh, it's like this entire talk is a section in the first chapter, and not even that. So it's, uh, But there's, there's great stuff in here. It's, uh, it's eight years old, but it's probably decades hand, ahead of the standard in many parts. There's lots of useful stuff there. Um, if you want to read more about the concepts technical specification, like details of how it's implemented and more usage examples, there's a great article series by Andrew Sutton, who is the editor of that concept TS. Um, and uh, also Bjarne has written a paper about concepts, explaining sort of the history, how they got into the language, what are the design decisions that they made and so on, and also how things you should use them correctly. Also a great introduction. Uh, and finally, if you want to read, prefer to read code, uh, Casey Carter, who is also on the Standards Committee, is working with Eric Niebler on what's planned to become STL2 in the future, based on Eric Niebler's ranges proposal. Uh, he has a, a, a test implementation of that uh, proposal there. So there you will find more fleshed out uh, tested versions of the things like semi-regular, regular, iterators, uh, uh, containers, ranges, and so on. Um, 
but as I said, yeah, it's still it's still being tweaked a lot uh, to make it work in all cases. It's it's quite complicated. Um, yeah. Uh, the examples you show, they were mostly uh, type traits. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, how far would we get with uh, just using a static assert on the top of your function? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there there are many techniques that people use already today, like static search, uh, this new like const expr if and uh, sfna, and you know enable if and all sorts of. But these are like all these are <laughs> attempts to get this with existing features, but they are quite complex and hard to explain uh, to people. Uh, you you can get some part of the way, but I think it's. Adding concepts to the language is a deliberate effort to make this simpler, simpler to programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you, uh, yeah. I don't know if uh, <laughs> that answered your question about. Uh, Adding more part. stuff makes it more complex as well. Yeah, yeah but my my hope is uh, that adding more stuff uh, in this case is going to make it possible to eventually remove other stuff. Uh, like in the standard, these things are described in a lot of text, uh, and you're expected to kind of know that. Now that could be actually checked by the compiler and de defined as part of the language. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a valid uh, point that you shouldn't <laughs> you should try to avoid. But I think this is kind of an example of a good feature where, where you can remove other stuff and explain yourself more uh, more cleanly in code. It's going to make template program uh, look a little bit more like nor normal programming with normal types. So, yeah. Uh, yes? Um, I was wondering, uh, as interesting as this is, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, very prominent C++ developers who are opposed to the idea of concepts. Mm -hmm. um, how much? Uh, how aware are you of the counter arguments? Well, yeah, I've heard counter arguments uh, for for uh, introducing concepts. I, I think there are there are kind of two two camps. <laughs> one one is that uh, you know some people uh, there used to be a concept proposal already before C plus plus eleven. So maybe some of you know about that. Uh, it it went much further. Uh, for instance, they wanted to do a checking of template uh, of the the code inside of the template as well. And and there are uh, criticisms that you know this is not going far enough, and they would like to see. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of work spent doing that. So I think there's still people opposed because they thought that was going to be better than this, uh, but they don't seem to be winning those arguments. Uh, 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 also, there there is the other side. Those are things, uh, yeah, like you said, that you can use existing features, and you could get uh, pretty far without adding it. So I, I think those are the two concerns. Uh, I think they're both valid concerns. Um, but if you you should read the uh, paper by Bjarne, it's it it has many good answers to. He he has heard all of those criticisms <laughs> too many times. Uh, so. Yeah. Yes. So how in a more practical view, who is going to define a lot of concepts? So who is going to define a lot of concepts? Of course, the standards committee. The standards uh, committee. A lot, like, uh, currently the only, uh, the only place where this is done that I know is the ranges work, the STL2 work, which include these uh, sort of fundamental concepts, uh, a lot of them. Uh, but I'm sure there's going to be work on some of the other parts uh, as well. You, uh, I don't know, concepts for networking or concurrency or hopefully, I mean, they're going <coughs> to... Do you think your uh, average you C++ programmer defining a lot of concepts in, a, in an application? Or? Uh, I think you should follow Stepanov's advice. Try to study the ones that already exist. It's much more, more worthwhile, actually. Uh, of course, I mean, feel free to experiment and, and, and get used to it, but uh, I mean, there... It, Actually, like finding a new, really interesting concept is a really big deal. It's worth pointing out that, I mean, Stepano he spent decades of his career just finding and clearly defining a few central concepts, like uh, like regular, like containers, iterators, 
concepts based on abstract algebra, you know, like semi-groups and that sort of thing. And I mean, even in those cases, he has not explored them completely by far. There are many more iterator concepts than we see in the STL. And like, if you discover a new iterator concept once in your career, that's a going to be a big deal. <laughs> you should name it after yourself and become famous or something. Uh, I suppose if you done badly, it would be rather annoying to have a lot of... Yes, uh, I, I, would, uh, I will also be afraid of that, that it's going to be uh, yeah, adding the wrong kind of restriction. I mean, this all comes from usefulness of algorithms. You have to start with algorithms, and it takes a long time to study different algorithms and finding out how they are connected and so on. And that's really hard in generic programming. Uh, so, yeah. So you imagine a minus minus no concepts flag for the... For the <laughs> Probably someone's going <laughs> to definitely want to have that as well. Uh, uh, but yeah, I think the, the average programmer is going to be very happy to have understandable error messages with templates and they're not going to be as afraid with templates anymore. That's hopefully will outweigh the <laughs> negative sides uh, um, a lot. I mean, C++ is not the ideal language for generic programming by far. There, you could go further, but it's the best we have <laughs> so far. Uh, a lot of this is still in, like, research stage. Uh, if you could check, uh, you know, what should you do about semantic checking? It could be useful for the compiler to, if you could say, like, this operation is commutative. I can reorder uh, the arguments for optimization, for example, that could be useful, but that's like, it's, it's research uh, at this point. There's nothing proposed for a, a practical language that I know. Um, the most practical thing is uh, error messages, then, or is there any other? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't show all uses of concepts. For example, like in C++11, we've got auto, uh, and you can use auto as a return uh, when you call a function. Some people don't like auto because they think it's not clear what the return type is. Uh, other people love it. With concepts, you're going to be able to say something like, instead, replace auto with regular. So that's kind of a middle ground. You will be able to have some check, some type checking there, but not strictly saying uh, what the type is. I don't know if that was clear. <laughs> I call a function that return... Uh, you know, a, a vector of ints. I could say, like, this has to be a con container as a re return concept, and we, and you can't, uh, yeah. So 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 it's still like auto, but it's it's going to be a little bit more clear what you're expecting. Yeah. People are going to find new uses for concepts. This is actually like Bjorn says he <laughs> he likes features like that that he can't anticipate what will is going to happen <laughs> like what people are going to invent with this so we'll have to see